And then any disease process, no matter what I look at, whether it's diabetes, whether it's irritable bowel, they all improve with exercise, even osteoarthritis, and I'll even show you that. And you think, well, the joints, you don't really wanna exercise if you have joints that are inflamed, but actually it shows to improve those joints. And then after the age of 40, all of us lose one to two pounds of muscle a year. And that's really important because muscle is our metabolically active um, uh, part of our body, whereas fat doesn't burn any calories, muscle burns a majority of our calories. So if we lose muscle, our uh, uh, metabolism actually decreases through time. So it becomes really important for exercise to build that muscle up and keep that muscle up or we'll start having um, uh, less caloric needs uh, while we eat the same, we're gonna gain weight. So exercise keeps that muscle on. So let's talk about longevity and the role of exercise. Uh, which type of exercise keeps you going or keeps you young? And that really is both, uh, both aerobic exercise and uh, a muscle um, weightlifting. Uh, which builds muscle. Uh, what we found though, uh, the big number that everybody says the American Diabetic Association is that 150 minutes a week of moderate uh, intensity exercise, which I'll talk to you what moderate intensity is, but <clears throat> as far as uh, what they've shown to be ideal is around four times that. Uh, three to four times that of moderate to high intensity exercise gives you even more benefit. So the 150 minutes of moderate exercise is kind of like a minimum of what we should be doing a week. But if we really want to take it up a notch and improve longevity, uh, which when we exercise, we turn on all these mechanisms that uh, clean up our cells, get rid of the dead cells, increase our mitochondria. So it's really important uh, that we, we do at least moderate, but even high intensity um, is even more important uh, at least two to three times a week. Uh, the other thing uh, we see is strength training uh, should be added to most exercise regimens. So if you're doing high intensity running or biking and these sort of things, you need to be doing strength training at least two to three times a week to slow down muscle mass loss, which I talked about, and this is associated with aging and disease as well. So which disease process improves with exercise? And I kind of already talked about uh, this earlier, but it's really every last one of them, whether it's diabetes, depression, hypertension, irritable bowel, arthritis, chronic fatigue, allergies, memory issues. Every one of these has numerous papers showing that people who exercise actually have increased um, uh, uh, anti-inflammatory mechanisms activated, their disease process is improved, and they have less symptoms. So here's uh, some papers. I just wanted uh, to show papers that go along with what I was talking about. And exercise and IBS, and it shows that increased physical activity improves GI symptoms and irritable bowel syndrome. And physically active patients with irritable bowel syndrome will face less symptom deterioration compared with physically inactive patients and physical activity should be used as a primary treatment modality in IBS. So that they're saying a primary modality, that should be the first thing we turn to uh, when we're having this process. So uh, arthritis, this is one that I thought was interesting uh, because you think, oh, you don't wanna really use those joints, but they showed uh, that osteoarthritis progression decreases with moderate exercise. Now, what's interesting about this slide, excessive exercise, not great. Uh, so moderate exercise, which I'll talk about what that is, uh, shows that it um, increases cartilage quality. Uh, it helps with the recycling and, and regeneration of the collagen. Um, and it stops the um, chondrocytes, which are the uh, things which make collagen and make cartilage. Uh, it helps them to uh, not die off. So moderate exercise is quite helpful. And there's also another study that showed that extensive evidence supports that exercise can significantly improve the quality of life of osteoarthritis patients by relieving pain and enhancing cardiorespiratory fitness and muscle strength. And finally, this one I find really interesting. You know, there's a lot more um, 
problems with blood sugar and diabetes. And this has been increasing over the years, of course, due to the American diet, excessive amounts of sugar intake. But what we find is that exercise, just 100 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise works just as good or better than most medicines that we use for diabetes. So dropping hemoglobin A1C by one point is a huge difference. So it's something that I think uh, we should be looking at as a early intervention for almost any disease process. If the doctor says you've got this, you probably ought to look at exercise, whether it's hypertension, high cholesterol, you name it. So how do we exercise? That's a great question because a lot of people, are that, that they don't know. They're like, well, should I do weightlifting or should I do running? Should I do uh, biking? And I just say, yes, whatever you like to do, do that, but do something and at least 150 minutes. So what is moderate exercise? The big word that everybody uses when we talk about exercise is moderate exercise. So um, moderate exercise is brisk walking. Uh, this is uh, it's a step up from a leisurely stroll. It's basically you want to walk hard enough that you can still talk and complete sentences, but you're not you're uh, you're you're still you feel your heart's up, um, but you don't want to be trying to breathe so hard that you can't say a complete sentence when you're walking with somebody. But you want to be more than just kind of rolling walking along, looking at the flowers, um, cycling at a steady pace, uh, riding a bike. Uh, on a flat surface is a good way to engage moderate exercise. If you hit some heels, you're probably going to go into a little more vigorous exercise, but that's okay. It's good if you can stand it. And this one's really good on the joints as well. Um, water aerobics, uh, another great way, especially if you have joint issues, is a great way to get exercise. And I really like swimming as well. Uh, you can make that moderate or vigorous. Uh, another way to think of this is doubles tennis. Singles tennis is probably more vigorous exercise, but doubles tennis, because you're covering less of the court, would be a good moderate exercise as well. As, and then dancing, if you really want to think of something that's fun, continuous dancing uh, or just dancing at home would be fine. That's another way to think about moderate exercise. <clears throat> and it should be enough to raise, your, uh, to raise your heart rate, get it above 100, 120, around that area, and break a sweat. So that's kind of what you can think of. Anything that does that is considered moderate exercise. So where does weightlifting fit in? Weightlifting, which is what I prefer, I, I do do some uh, aerobic exercise, but I like weightlifting because it improves strength, bone density, and functional movement. Uh, it prevents muscle loss as you age, and I mentioned that earlier, but Really, we should, that is the thing we should be the most concerned about as we age is this loss of muscle and the atrophy of muscle. So we really, the more we can do heavy lifting, do some weight lifting at least two to three times a week, the better we are when we turn 80. It's kind of like putting a muscle away for your retirement. You need to be fighting that muscle loss. Uh, it's a lot harder as you get older and all of a sudden say, hey, we'll lift weights you can't put that muscle on as easily as you can if you start when you're, it's early. Uh, the other thing is a lot, I, you don't hear a lot about older people and weightlifting, but it's really beneficial in older adults. Uh, it improves uh, bone density, it improves strength, of course, uh, and weightlifting in older adults results in less injuries. And then there's a huge positive impact on physical and psychological health with this, uh, especially as people grow older. Uh, we see a big benefit with weightlifting. So here's an area that I think is really important. As I, I, I know there's a lot of ultra athletes out there. I tend to not be big into doing excessive exercise because as you can see in this graph, more is not better. Um, but it's just, you know, that more is better, but not too much is what I'm trying to say. And that you can do more exercise but there is a fine line when you cross into the really overtraining, and we see, uh, according to this graph, the health risk actually increases after you cross this line. So, working out four to five times a week, uh, working out, you know, uh, maybe 300 minutes a week, three to 400 minutes, that would probably be um, the the extent of where I would go with exercise because. Once you start getting to these um, excessive exercise states, 
the body doesn't recover from the inflammation it creates. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, but really exercise is about creating inflammation. So when you exercise, you're, you're tearing up muscle, you're creating injury so that the body can go back and repair that. And when it repairs it, it makes you better than you were before. It increases the size of your muscle so that next time you pick up something heavy, it's easier to pick up. The next time you run, you can run faster. Uh, these sort of things, but you have to have enough time for recovery. And if you're state of chronic inflammation, you don't really have that chance to recover. And so the body starts getting uh, chronic damage. And so we want to make sure we give ourselves enough time to recover. It's just as important as exercise is the time that we recover. So we don't want to overdo it. There is, and, and we all know people, we've all heard the stories of people you know, marathon runner or someone who, and all of a sudden they fall over from a heart attack. I think it's due to this overtraining syndrome. So optimizing exercise. This is one that I, I really focus on in my practice, but eight hours of sleep is non-negotiable. So if you have sleep deprivation, you have problems with muscle recovery. So if you're exercising, if you're lifting weights, if you're running, if you're swimming, all of these things, that's great. But remember what I said about you need time to allow those muscles to recovery or you're not really getting any of the benefits of the exercise you've done. So sleep deprivation negatively impacts the recovery of muscle injury induced by high intensity exercise. Adequate sleep is crucial for muscle repair and recovery, especially after intense physical activity. Uh, here's another paper that shows that sleep's role, in athlete, uh, sleep's role in athlete's recovery. For athletes, sleep is essential for recovery from fatigue with the physiologic and psychologic restorative effects. Monitoring sleep can help in optimizing training and reducing the risk of injury and in illness. And that's the problem. If you're exercising, you're not sleeping, you're not recovering, you're more likely to get injured and then you really are going to have issues with uh, your ability to exercise. What about the role of diet? We always hear, you know, diet, uh, eat right and exercise, but what does the eat right mean? Uh, and so a lot of people will think that we have to be on these really extreme diets that we need to be eating mainly protein, animal-based protein, um, and that we can't really deviate from that. Carbs are bad. Uh, and so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the role of diet here, but while there are differences in dietary intake and health behaviors between vegans uh, and omnivores, the evidence suggests that a vegan diet does not negatively impact muscle strength or endurance and may even offer some benefit in these areas. So I don't think it really matters as long as you're really eating a lot of whole foods, both fruits and vegetables. Uh, your proteins can be plant-based but I would definitely make sure that you're getting enough leucine. That's the magic amino acid that uh, animal proteins have. But if you get around two to four grams of leucine after a workout, you're gonna do fine if you're vegan. Uh, so it's not something that you have to be like, oh, I have to be a carnivore uh, or you know these sort of things. So timing is important when you work out. Um, you need to eat if you're gonna eat, eat two hours prior so that blood flow to the muscles are, are not impaired. I personally like to work out in the mornings. I never eat before I work out, but I do use a pre-workout uh, amino acid that I'll talk to you about. But if you're gonna work out, let's say after you get off work, don't eat right before you work out. Eat at least you know two hours before. And then the key, the magic to eating and working out is really, you need to eat about within that one hour period after you work out. That's the magic time to eat. 